Dobrý den, jmenuji se Vojtěch Rybka, jsem z Ústavu pro studium totalitních režimů a jménem všech organizátorů konference Dějiny ve veřejném prostoru vystavování minulosti bych vás rád srdečně přivítal a to jako účastníky, ne jen jako diváky. Forum Dějiny ve veřejném prostoru je platformou pro komunitu, kterou zajímá dění ve veřejném prostoru a která chce toto dění pozorovat a analyzovat a v nějakém smyslu se ho také přímo či nepřímo účastnit. Využíváme přitom společně různorodých odborností a scházíme se již po druhé. V roce 2018 se jsme se společně zastavili u historických výročí. Na webu dnes zahajované konference jsou k nalezení všechna minulá vystoupení a jejich výběr je možné si přečíst v tištěné podobě v zvláštním čísle časopisu Marginalia Historika. Velká část těch studií je dostupná online. Co myslíme pod tím souslovým veřejný prostor? Upozorňovali jsme, že jde o definici velmi širokou, ale nejpozději od zimy tohoto roku nás už asi nikoho nemůže představit, že do toho počítáme a že se nemůžeme vyhnout velkému vlivu online prostoru. Zvláště v době, kdy fyzický prostor pro tuto konferenci je nedostupný. Protože jsme si vědomi toho, že setkání tváří v tvář nelze zcela nahradit touto online podobou, rádi bychom vás předem pozvali na živou část DRP Forum, kterou doufáme, že budeme moci uskutečně v květnu a kde se formáty, které jsme slibovali a připravili, a které pro online podobu nejsou vhodné, mám na mysli zejména workshopy, a odehrají v krásných prostorách IPRU. A buďte tedy vítáni a sledujte dále hlavní stránku forumdvp.cz. Usilujeme o to, abychom vystoupili z nějakého zavedeného disciplinárního vidění a obohatili se tady společně o úhly pohledu zvenku, o jiné zájmy, jiná zaměření a jiné součásti veřejných prostorů, než na které jsme ve svých profesích nejzvyklejší. Doufáme, že ještě více než v roce 2018 dojde k propojení a vzájemnému obohacení muzejních pedagogů historiků, studentů, mediálních analytiků, pedagogů základních, středních i vysokých škol, kurátorů, památkářů, architektů a dalších. Alespoň takhle široká paleta se nabízí v programu vystavování minulosti pro tento rok z hlediska mluvčích. To vystavování minulosti se zdá jako pouze aktivní proces. Konec konců již při volbě názvu v programovém výboru jsme se snažili zahrnout do toho názvu i tu pasivní stránku, protože všichni jsme v nějaké podobě historie ve veřejném prostoru i vystaveni. A konferenci neodehráváme pouze dnes a zítra, ale rozložili jsme ji na týdny nebo dokonce měsíce a velká část toho programu, který jsme naplánovali do IPRU na dnešek a zítřek, se tedy odehraje v listopadu a v prosinci. V listopadu se zaměříme na inventuru paměťových kaus z veřejného prostoru. V prosinci, počátkem prosince se podíváme na památky. 10. prosince, zejména pro anglicko-jazyčné publikum, bude druhý keynote speaker Robert Stredling, britský 
klasik uh, historického vzdělávání a dále se budeme věnovat vzdělávání jako takové. A rád bych uh, srdečně poděkoval všem pořádajícím institucím v Univerzitě Karlově, kde se podílí Filozofická a Pedagogická fakulta, dále Univerzitě Jana Evangelisty v Kině, Historickému ústavu Akademie věd, a, a samozřejmě i kolegům a kolegyním z našeho ústavu pro studium totalitních režimů. A mediálními partnery konference je časopis Dějiny a současnost a informační server pro památky. A přestože nesedíme nikdo v IPRU, přesto Institut plánování a rozvoje hlavního města Prahy je i nadále partnerem a doufáme, že se podaří s ním ten náhradní termín doplánovat. V tuhle chvíli bych rád předal slovo Václavu Lisikstovi, který vás provede a zahájí keynote speaker Barbara Kershenblatt, která za chviličku začne. Děkuji. Would you like me to begin? Uh, I, I would like to first introduce you. It's my okay, pleasure sure. to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Mrs. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. She's one of the leading persons in global debates in ex exhibiting the past in museums. She is also an author of many books and papers related to the museum studies, mass tourism, and commodification of history. She is also an expert in study, study of Jewish culture. Uh, you can meet her or other part of her, her work in Warsaw because she is a chief, chief curator of the core exhibition here in Poland Museum of History of Polish Jews. And there is also a literally fresh option uh, to meet her uh, work. We have translated and published her text called Museum as Catalyst in our new book called uh, How We Exhibit Contemporary History, the Museum in Discussion. So I strongly, strongly recommend the text to your attention. Before we start, I would like to invite you to discussion because there will be a time dedicated to ask questions to Barbara. You can ask both in Czech or in English language through app uh, Slido or in chat on both your YouTube channels. To access the Slido, please type in your browser uh, sly.do and insert the event code DVP2020. All information you can find in description under the videos on YouTube. Looking forward to your, uh, to your questions. And now uh, I wish good morning to New York and the floor is open to the keynote lecture called Exhibit Exhibiting History, Making History, Transnational Perspective. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Václav, and I do uh, appreciate the invitation. I think that um, it's a very, very important topic, and this conference gave me, and this, uh, this invitation to give a keynote gave me an opportunity to think about and even rethink um, what we're doing when we create museums of history, exhibitions of history, and function as public historians. So what I'm going to do now is to share my screen and I just need to, to see how I'm gonna do that. Yes, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm really interested in what we're calling paradigm shifts. And the first paradigm shift that I, I want us to think about is the paradigm shift in the very concept and definition of museums. Because I think that this, this has to be our starting point. So let's begin with UNESCO's International Council on Museums. And let's begin with the uh, definition that was last revised in 2007. The museum is a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researchers, communicates, 
and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. Now, nothing could be further from the attempt to create a new definition and for, for what has happened to museums since the onset of what's called the new museology, which is now um, approximately 50 years old. About 50 years ago, there was a call for something called the new museology. And, and this definition does not even begin to hint at developments in the field that precede it by decades. And I would say that the only significant um, uh, element in this, if you will, updated definition is the incorporation of intangible heritage. Uh, previously, that distinction wasn't there. And so what has happened, um, we can see from a call in 2018 where the executive board said, we need an alternative definition. We need a new definition. What would it recognize? Dissimilar conditions and practices of museums in diverse and rapidly changing societies. And certainly as to whether or not this new definition meets this diagnosis, uh, we, can, we can decide. But we certainly know that the conditions in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe are very different from Western Europe, and that Europe is very different from North America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and other parts of the world, to say nothing of Russia, China, um, etc. Then the second point that the executive board called for was that museums should support that 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 the new definition should support museums in developing and adopting new scientific paradigms and addressing more adequately the complexities of the 21st century. In other words, this definition would not be descriptive. It wouldn't be based on the status quo. And it would be not only a definition, but also it would be to some degree aspirational. It would be to some degree prescriptive in other words that it would be look it would be a definition that would be looking forward and that would be encouraging museums to be different from what they are currently there, so there was the sense that the the definition would in its in its very formulation be activist and in fact the definition itself that is, the act of defining would be activist, and the definition itself would be activist. So, so what does it, what, uh, where is it coming from? So in this volume, Museum Critique, from, the, from Museum Critique to the Critical Museum in 2017, which predates this call, you already have an effort to update the new museology, which 50 years later isn't so new. And so what is the difference between Museum Critique which is essentially the so-called new museology and the critical museum. What is the jump? What is the leap that, um, uh, that uh, Katarzyna and Piotr were trying to make in this volume? And they define it as follows, that the critical museum, in other words, museum critique is a kind of reflection on the history of museums, their practices, what's wrong with them, and taking a kind of critical perspective on one's practice. But museum critique is not the same thing as a critical museum. So what's the difference? A critical museum would contribute to debates on the issues most fundamental to the contemporary world. And so it would be very, I would say, no matter how historical the museum, it would be, it, it would think about its history in relation to contemporary issues. Secondly, it will empower, empower the viewer. This is huge. That is to say that it would not only be, I would say, visitor-centered, which is part of the paradigm shift, that it's less about collections, more about visitors, that it's less about showing and more about engaging. So those are all paradigm shifts. But empowering the viewer is linked to what I will argue is a fundamental role of museums, but an even more, even more so in relation to history museums, namely the strengthening of the resilience of civil society. 
So empowering the viewer. And that it would expose conflicts, not only expose them, but redress social inequalities. Now, this does not sound to me like the contemporary situation in, well, certainly in Poland, which I'll talk about in a moment, but this, this represents the way, this is what represents a way of thinking about the difference between museum critique, what's wrong with what, with what we have been, to the critical museum as an actor in contemporary society. So then let's turn now to the 2018-19 effort uh, on the part of the committee that was tasked with coming up with a new definition. And let, let's look at it because I think that many of the things that interest us in this paradigm shift in thinking about history museums is already anticipated here. Now, I should say that this definition was presented at the most recent um, ICOM meeting in Kyoto, and it was subject to very intense debate. There was no vote taken on it. The only agreement was that we should keep on discussing it. So, uh, and there were strong advocates for it, and there were many museums that said, this is not us, we can't do this, and we need to find some way of coming up with a definition that will suit this diversity. Because there's a set of presuppositions here that are not shared. Okay, so museums are democratizing, inclusive, polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the past and the future. Well, as you'll see from some of the examples that I'll pro uh, provide, this may be true about what I'd call mature democracies, but it's much harder to think in these terms in some post-communist Central and East European societies that are young democracies moving towards autocracies. So this first sentence is based on a set of presuppositions that don't apply across the board. Second, acknowledging and addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present. They hold artifacts and specimens in trust for society, safeguard diverse memories for future generations, and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. Well, I would say that the, um, the proviso, the disclaimer is in the first part of the sentence. Acknowledging and addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present day. Yes and no, as you'll see from some of the examples that I'll present. And that is there because this definition wants to retain something of the old definition. And the old definition is about holding artifacts and specimens in trust for society and safeguarding and guarantee, et cetera. And then there's the guaranteeing of equal rights and equal access, um, et cetera. Then museums are not for profit. Well, there are museums that are for profit. And, um, and the, the Dead AR Museum in Berlin would be an example. The Spine Museum in Washington would be an example. Um, and there are other for-profit museums, which doesn't make them any less museums. They are participatory and transparent and work in active partnership with and for diverse communities. That's definitely the new definition. And then we have the folding in of the old definition to collect, preserve, research, research, interpret, exhibit, and enhance understandings of the world, aiming to contribute to human dignity and social justice, global equality, and planetary well being. In other words, there is a kind of, I would say, universalist, um, there's a universalist value here that has under it, I would say, an opposition to highly nationalistic, patriotic, and inward-looking museums that take a very, um, I would say, well, basically very um, national, if not nationalistic approach to the histories that they present. So you can see um, that there is a kind of hybrid here between the 2007 definition and a definition coming from the notion of a critical museum.
Now, the cultural specificity, I would say, of that new definition can also be captured by these two by these two images and the statements that they make. The first is coming from the United States. How do we restore trust in our democracies? Museums can be a starting point. Trust in our democracies. Well, there are some places where museums cannot be a starting point, and we'll see that in some of the Polish examples. And then we have from the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, there is not only one story, there is not only one history, but history is multiple. Now that is really specific to Western Europe, very specific to, I would say, the UK, to North America, to the English speaking world for sure. And these concepts, which definitely are a very particular view, and they're coming from what I'd call mature democracies, um, are not are not widely are not shared in other parts of Europe, and it particularly um, in, in some of the set places that we'll discuss. So I want to start with the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe and to the Information Center, and I want to start here because I think it represents one, uh, if you will, one end of a spectrum, and and it has been inspiring in ways that I think might be quite surprising. And so let's let's start with it. So first of all, of course, Berlin is the, if you will, the capital of the, the Nazi regime that produced the Holocaust. And of, of course, my interest, um, given my work in on Pauline Museum and my, my field, which is specifically looking at East, uh, East, East European Jews and especially Polish Jews, of course, um, the Holocaust is, is for me a, a touchstone for thinking. So uh, uh, the Jewish community in Berlin didn't want this memorial. This is the Eisenman Memorial. And uh, basically, um, and the memorial, memorial itself is this uh, very abstract, very, very minimalist field of stones or field of Stella. And it doesn't communicate the story. And it's extremely open to to interpretation and to the ways in which visitors engage with it. And many of the ways in which they engage with it are highly controversial, uh, playful, I would say even, let's say, irreverent, sacrilegious, uh, irrespect, uh, 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 disrespectful. Um, but in, in other ways, it's really quite powerful. But what I think is important here for us as, as thinking of it as one end of the spectrum is how abstract it is how minimalist it is, how open it is to interpretation, experience, and engagement, and how many risks it takes in allowing visitors to do things that would be, I would say, completely out of the question at, others, at, at other sites that are more prescriptive. Now, what I find most interesting about this site is not just the memorial itself, but I'm hoping that I can move the slide, yes, but is rather what is underneath it. So there is a very, very modest sign that says information center. It doesn't say exhibition. It doesn't say museum. It doesn't even say exhibition. It says information center. Now, information center sounds like that's where you'd go to get tickets or a subway map, or um, you, where you go to get information. It doesn't even give you a hint or a clue what's there. Now, what's there, in fact, is a narrative exhibition that has virtually or almost no objects, and that many visitors say that it's here that they feel the greatest impact of the site, and it is here that they actually fully or truly understand what the point of the site is, not, not in this very abstract um, immemorial. However, what I think is a hallmark of a, I would say, overwhelmingly German approach to treating a traumatic history, you can see it here. And, and, and you will see it also in many, other, in many other instances, whether it's the crimes of the Wehrmacht exhibition or it's the new Buchenwald exhibition. Um, 
I can uh, cite umpteen examples, and I, I would give I would characterize it in the following way: that it is unspectacular, that it is by design, cold, clinical, documentary, factual, and extremely powerful, so that this. This approach, which is very German, is um, it's, it's a way it, it, the, the way I'd characterize this approach, which is also my own approach, which is that the hotter the subject, the cooler the treatment, that the cool that, that the the tension between the power of the subject and the coolness of the treatment, that tension produces a very high impact effect, a very high impact experience. And this exhibition is brilliant in terms of its, um, um, I would say, elegance and minimalism of communication. And so I, I, I use it as a kind of one end of the spectrum. And what I would argue is that in this instance, the visitors who come to this exhibition, especially the German visitors, bring the emotion with them and that that the emotion itself is so powerful and so troubling and so difficult that the exhibition um, that that it would be it's unimaginable that the exhibition would use spectacular means to create strong emotional effects so let's take this then as the one end of the spectrum very minimalist, documentary, factual. But what I would argue is that it's a supreme example of what I would call felt facts. And, and, and what um, others have referred to as, if you will, the eloquence of evidence. So th let's take that as our starting point. Now, I think it's, for me, it was absolutely fascinating and we're going to make, we're going to travel across the ocean, travel across the Atlantic, and we are going to go to the United States, and we are going to go to the South. Uh, we are, and, and, you know, today, in, with all of the Black Lives um, uh, Matter and the, uh, all of the protests that have been going on in the United States around police brutality and systemic racism and judicial injustice, with all of that, this museum, which has been open just a few years, is in the heart of the South and in the heart, of course, of, 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 uh, of the history of slavery. And it's an extraordinary museum. And um, I, I think that you'll understand in a moment why I place this example second. So, and this example is, I would say, I wouldn't say it's the other extreme. It's its, its own, it's, it's sui generis in many ways. So this is the Legacy Museum, and it is a combination of a museum and a memorial, as is, of course, the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. And that relationship between, between museum and memorial is something that we should discuss, because from my point of view and what we did in Poland was to put the memorial and the museum in a complementary relationship, but not to fuse them, not to make the memorial into a museum and the museum into, into a memorial. And I think that this that, that, that the, uh, the Berlin example and this example, in fact, are, are successful in making the two complementary without fusing them. Now, the, the Legacy Museum. This museum, interestingly, is known colloquially as the lynching museum, but you could never imagine them, and lynching, as you know, in, well, you'll see in a moment, um, and you cannot imagine this museum calling itself officially the lynching museum, but you can see that its subtitle tells you everything from enslavement to mass incarceration. In other words, this is what I would call a lingering history museum. It is a museum that is a history, if you will, of a particular aspect of slavery, but a, uh, a way of thinking about the, uh, I would say, end of, end of slavery and the civil rights movement and all that followed 
as a lingering history that expresses itself today in mass incarceration. And of course, the mission of the museum is to address those contemporary issues. So this museum, I would say, exemplifies the new definition of museum, but it does it in a very, very interesting way. And so when it opened, the New York Times covered it and, and uh, said of it, a lynching, a lynching memorial. So it's, this is, I find this astonishing uh, because it, it, the, the museum doesn't call itself a lynching memorial. It's a memorial. A lynching memorial is opening. The country has never seen anything like it. Now, the memorial calls itself a national memorial for peace and justice. And the museum calls it the Legacy Museum. It doesn't use the language, which is really incendiary language of lynch lynching. So how does it define what it is? And it only it's only been open to, uh, I would say, less than two years. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which opened to the public on April 26, 2018, is the nation's first memorial dedicated to the legacy of enslaved black people, people terrorized by lynching, African-Americans humiliated by racial segregation and Jim Crow, and people of color burdened with contemporary presumptions of guilt and police violence. And of course, in the museum that is addressed and its end point is mass incarceration. That is that the percentage of African-Americans and uh, uh, black people in prisons in the United States is so disproportionate to their percentage of the population. So, uh, and the legacy here, this is a very, very different from muse different museum from the Museum of African-American History and Culture, which also opened recently in Washington, DC on the uh, National Mall. Um, and it would be very interesting to compare these two museums, but I've selected this one uh, for, for several reasons. And um, so first of all, it's site specific and it reminds you of the site itself, that you're standing on a site where enslaved people were actually warehoused and it's right next to one of the biggest and most important auction blocks where, um, where Africans that have been brought to the United States to be enslaved were actually sold. And so um, you may see something reminiscent if you look at the right hand, the right corner of this image, that there were two inspirations, two models for this museum. And believe it or not, one of the models was the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe and to the stelae. Only instead of the stelae, which are reminiscent of tombstones, um, but also of, if you will, faceless, anonymous, numbered persons that instead of them rising up from the ground in this memorial, they hang from the, from the ceiling. And so they are, that is, uh, they are images as if the stelae in, the, in Berlin are, if you will, suggestive, evocative of tombstones, these hanging elements are evocative of people being hung from trees, of being lynched. So they are, they are just reversed, but they're inspired, believe it or not, by the Berlin Memorial and by the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. Now here is the dedication in, at, at the entrance. For the hanged and beaten, for the shot, drowned and burned, for the tortured and tormented and terrorized, for those abandoned by the rule of law, we will remember with hope because hopelessness is the enemy of justice, with courage because peace requires bravery, with persistence because justice is a constant struggle, with faith because we shall overcome. And of course, that is a reference to the, to the song, uh, We Shall Overcome. So I, I just found it extraordinary that the Berlin Memorial would be an inspiration for, for this museum in Montgomery, Alabama. So here you can see how powerful is this reversal of, um, of the memorials of the Eisenman uh, concept. Now, these stelae aren't, that in, now here's a very big difference. And that is there's nothing engraved at all 
on the stelae at the uh, in Berlin. Here, what is engraved is the location of the lynching and those who were lynched, and also the date of their lynching, which actually goes all the way to the to the 1980s, to our recent times. But the other thing that, um, and, and, and also the idea of terrorism being, um, if you will, uh, given a kind of wider understanding. So lynching and racial terrorism as a kind of ongoing lived experience. Now on the right, which I think is really absolutely fascinating, is that the museum gathered earth from each of the sites where the lynchings took place. And this, um, I would say to give a kind of materiality to the sites themselves, that it is not just this um, these stelae or these these hanging elements, but also uh, but uh, but also the the actual the earth from the actual sites, which um, I think is really very powerful. And then the um, very end of the exhibition is a multimedia exhibit allowing visitors to quote speak to inmates on death row. Um, and, in, and, and in this particular case, a man who was wrongly convicted of two murders. So this is a very powerful museum that is intended to use historical awareness to bring about change. And it it de- it, it is um, and in that way, it is a perfect example of the activist museum. Now there are also these elements outdoors. And the intention here is that these communities will actually take these elements and bring them back to their places because uh, because these are elements that essentially document uh, the lynchings that took place in each of these locations. And it's a way of um, encouraging, um, activating communities to take ownership of their own involvement, their own histories. And to be, I would say that the museum itself is what I would call, and so is in in that way, so is the the Berlin Museum. It is an indicting museum. It indicts those who committed the crimes and it asks these places to become self-indicting, to take ownership of the crimes that were committed there. Now, Darya Stola, the former director of Pauline Museum, makes a very wise statement. He says that we, our generation, and this is perhaps more true of more distant events, are not personally responsible for what those before us did, but we are responsible for what we do with that knowledge. And here at this museum are the opportunities for for these communities to self-indict and take responsibility for what they did, and for younger generations to take responsibility for the knowledge that they have of what those before them that did. Now, there's another aspect of this museum that I think represents a kind of paradigm shift, and that is, it is a a use of, I would say, a poetic register. And that is drawing on literature and drawing on um, artists to communicate in ways that are not didactic, not factual, uh, not cold, in fact, very warm. And in that way, and, and, and also to appeal to visitors who don't respond to the abstraction, but for whom a more, I would say, uh, familiar form of commemoration is meaningful and And this is from a Ghanaian artist who was invited to create the work. And this is an exhibition on slavery. So the idea is to communicate in different ways, communicate for different kinds of visitors, and to communicate in ways that the arts and poetics can can do and that a more didactic approach cannot. But what I would also say is that this is a highly emotional approach. That is, it's a mixture of the factual, but also, um, I wouldn't call it spectacular, but I'll show you some examples of that as well. Now, there's this example, the German-Russian Museum, Berlin, Karlshorst, is a very interesting example, and there's really only one 
uh, point that I want to make about it because I know, I'm not aware of other museums that take this approach. There must be, but this one um, is particularly interesting. So it's a site specific museum in Berlin, and it, the site itself is the place where the Germans, um, where there was the unconditional capitulation of the Germans uh, to, the, to the Soviets and the signing of the end of the war. And so for a long time, um, it, it, it was not, um, well, certainly the, the new exhibition, which is just several years old, is unusual. Um, and, you know, I think when you visit it, you can judge how successfully they achieve this in that it offers what I would, it offers a double narration. It offers, that is to say, they put together a team of German historians and Russian historians, and they, they didn't just co-narrate a kind of compromise narrative that would uh, fuse Russian and German perspectives. They actually did a double narration so that there's a, um, a narration from a German perspective, a nar narration from the Russian perspective, and those two perspectives are also doubled because in each of those perspectives, there is a narration that is, if you will, the, the military story, but also, uh, that is to say, a, a, um, a perpetrator story and a victim story. So it's like doubled narration, doubled. And I think that um, a, a very interesting aspect for us to think about in terms of paradigm shifts is not only narrative, what is the story that's being told, but narration, the mode of narration, how the story is being told. And I think that this one is a, a particularly interesting example. And it's very documentary as well. Um, and of course, they're original objects, but the original objects are quite often shown in those lower cases, and they don't really function as, um, as an integral part of the narrative. They're rather a kind of material and emotional touchstone that supports the narrative that depends almost exclusively on, um, I would say, small iPads, photographs, documents, texts, maps, and essentially a graphic approach. So let me turn uh, now to Poland. And uh, of course, it's a case that I know, I know best, but also I think that it's particularly relevant because I think that post-communist post -communist Central and Eastern Europe are, are really interesting. They are a kind of a mix of new democracies, young democracies, and a shift to authoritarian regimes. So it's in a way we've got everything happening. So, um, and I will talk about Pauline Museum, which was created before uh, the the advent of the new ruling of the ruling party of um, the Law and Justice ruling party, which is a right wing party. Now, when President Duda uh, ran for office. He ran on a platform that underpins this statement from November 11th, 2015, shortly after he was elected president of Poland. Quote, Poland needs an historical policy and a debate on how to shape civic and patriotic attitudes. Civic attitudes is not enough, but, it, but, but the operative term here is patriotic. He invoked the view of the late president Lech uh, Kaczynski, who said that one must not equate patriotism with nationalism because their roots are entirely different. The foundation of patriotism is love, whereas that of nationalism or xenophobia is hatred. But as we will see, patriotism and nationalism have been fused, and xenophobia, and particularly most recently on the platform of the of the uh, most recent election, which was a platform of anti-LGBT. Um, it's clear. It's clear that uh, there is a kind of fusion here. Now, the um, I would say that, as you'll well, as you'll see in a moment, museums are understood in Poland by the right wing government, uh, very much I would say in the 2007 ICOM definition, and definitely not in what was proposed in 2018, 2019. And in opposing um, the Minister of Culture's funding of Jewish projects, um, this particular, this uh, Robert Vinitsky, who is from a far-right party, held, held the Minister of Culture to task. 
and essentially asked the Minister of Culture, who was proposing to create a museum of the Warsaw Ghetto, he asked the Minister of Culture, what kind of museum would it be? And he, and he made a distinction that tells you everything about the competing concept of museums and which one prevails in the new right in the right wing government's view. And he said, will the new museum of the Warsaw Ghetto be a quote traditional museum that tells a quote objective history, which of course means the history that follows the historical policy of the Minister of Culture, or will it be a modern museum like Pauline Museum, where history is a starting point for debate, which is a very bad idea. So that the museums of the of the traditional kind, which is the kind that the Minister of Culture, the Ministry of Culture uh, advocates, is an instrument of state historical policy, not an independent museum that supports democratic values and debate and multiple voices and the like. Okay, just one second. Let me let me make sure that I'm okay. And so, what does that what does that mean? Well, let's let's look at the Museum of the Second World War. The Museum of the Second World War, a major project that was developed in Gdańsk under the center right government. It was a pet project of Donald Tusk. And it's in a city that is um, a very European city, a very a city with um, an incredible history of being a German city, a Polish city, uh, a uh, a free city, um, an international city, part of the Hanseatic League. It is a very multicultural city and a very open and very European oriented city, as we know from the European Solidarity Center, which will be a very interesting um, museum for us to talk about as well. And so. This museum, a, a, a wonderful museum, that deals with the Second World War, um, although it deals with it as a world war and it does refer to the other theaters of war, in fact, it's very European in its focus and it places the, the conflict in Poland within a wider European perspective. And, um, and you can see here, this is a very Polish museum. This is unimaginable unimaginable in a, a state museum in um, um, in Poland. I mean, pardon me, in Germany. Maybe, maybe not unimaginable, but certainly this is not the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. This is not its information center. This is definitely, um, I would say, a very theatrical, very spectacular, very high emotional approach. And so when the center-right government came in, the first thing they wanted to do was to take control of this museum and to change it to meet their idea of what a museum should be and to meet their historical policy. And what is their historical policy? Their historical policy is to defend the good name of Poland. And uh, when the uh, Minister of Culture, uh, pardon me, when the, the President of Poland, Duda, ran for president, his platform was down with the pedagogy of shame, up from our knees. And so the purpose of these museums is to defend the good name of Poland and that the history of the of World War II were, as presented in this museum was criticized. And so Pavel Machevich, who is a wonderful historian and the previous director, the war that never ends. And of course, the war is the museum war. What was the problem with this museum? The problem was that it was, quote, not Polish enough from the Ministry of Culture's perspective, that it was pacifist. And, and, and why? Because the paradigm shift that this museum represents is a shift from a celebratory, militaristic, nationalistic, patriotic approach to this history to an approach that was European and that placed civilians at the center of the story. And that was rather than a war museum, it was a war museum that was an advocate for peace by showing the cost of war on the civilian population. That is a paradigm shift. And that did not suit this, um, this current regime. 
But recently, literally in the last weeks, there was a lawsuit to defend the intellectual rights of the creator of this museum, of the creators of this museum, and they won. And the most egregious change that was made when the Minister of Culture fired the current regime and instituted their own director and their own people and their own policy was a change of the final film from a film that would, would basically widen the story to the rest of Europe and bring it up to date to a film that would celebrate Polish, uh, vic well, I would say Polish heroism and Polish losses. Now, let me uh, let me conclude with uh, what I think the, the what the paradigm shift that the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews represents, and I will do this uh, very briefly, and I of course can say more about this uh, during our discussion. But um, what I'd like to say is that we should see these museums in each instance as part of a network of, a part of a kind of historical, a network where the story, whatever the larger story is that's being told is told across uh, a set of sites that, this, that, let me put it this way, that the historical narrative is distributed across a set of sites. So if we were to think about Poland, for example, what, how, how is the narrative being distributed? And it's a little bit, uh, I would say it's a kind of cacophony because it represents some very different notions of what the story is and what these institutions are. So we would look at, for example, European Solidarity Center and the, um, the Museum of the Second World War and the Museum of Emigration in Gdańsk, for instance, in relation to the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews and various other projects on, for example, um, on the Polish righteous. And we would, we would look right across the whole territory and say to ourselves, if we put all those museums, if we put them on a map and we asked ourselves, how is this history being distributed? We would see, um, I would say, almost a kind of archeology span of historical narrative. But let's look for a moment at Pauline Museum. Site-specific museum on the rubble of the destroyed Warsaw Ghetto and pre-war Jewish neighborhood, uh, facing the monument to the ghetto heroes, to the monument to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, which was unveiled in 1948 on the rubble of the ghetto on the fifth anniversary of the uprising, sitting today in a, a residential neighborhood in central Warsaw uh, with communist era residential buildings, facing the monument again in a complementary relationship with, and I think this is really important, and that is that this is a minimalist exterior. This building in that way is more consistent with the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe with all the drama on the inside. It is a private, pri private public partnership, and this is critically important to our relative autonomy in this more authoritarian regime. Now, without a collection, we are we, we could have gone two directions. If you don't have a collection or you don't want to use a collection, you can go the route of the Murder Jews of Europe Memorial. And you can be, or there are various other examples, Crimes of the Wehrmacht, for example, that exhibition. You can go completely documentary. You can go completely scans of photographs, texts, um, light boxes, audiovisual. Or you can go another direction, which is the direction that we took, which is to create a theater of history, but not a theater of history that is over the top spectacular, which is actually being proposed to some degree for Babin Yar in Kiev in Ukraine. And that's another whole conversation that we can have also maybe during the discussion. Our theater of history is predicated on another set of principles entirely. I like to think that there is a paradigm shift here, not that multimedia narrative museums are new. They are not new at all. But the way in which at Pauline Museum we've been thinking about what we call narrative space, uh, a theater of mise-en-scene, if you will, still life theater, a, a way of thinking about a theater of history is very specific to this museum. And I'm not aware that it is um, uh, uh, been, uh, it, that it has been thought in these, about in these terms elsewhere. But also, there's, uh, from a paradigm shift point of view, what I would argue, 
is the uh, how do we place the traumatic history within this thousand year history of Polish Jews? Where is the traumatic history placed, and especially its most traumatic moments? And I would say the Holocaust gallery, the Holocaust period, and also uh, the particularly the immediate post-war period in the Third Polish Republic. So, uh, or the People's uh, Republic uh, uh, right after the war. And, and what, uh, the way in which we do that, I think, is very particular, and it represents what I call placing the Holocaust within the axis of history rather than with an axis of genocide, which is currently an approach that is being widely uh, adopted by Holocaust museums that want to expand along this axis of genocide to essentially make themselves human rights museums and move from the Holocaust to, quote, other genocides. So that's the axis of genocide. Here we have placed the Holocaust within the axis of, of history. We do show objects, but there's certainly not enough to uh, communicate what we want to communicate. But I, I just want to give you a couple of images to give you the feel. Give you the feel. Well, one of the most important things that we did was to develop a set of meta-historical principles. I won't go through all of them, but I simply want to mark that as a way of thinking about a history museums, there is not only the story that we want to tell, but there are also the meta-historical principles that will guide that story, particularly if we do not want to present what could be called a master narrative when we want to create an open narrative and we want to create it based on a set of principles that will guide not only the story, but also the mode of narration. Now, where this becomes most critical, and, um, and I, so I want to really focus specifically on the Holocaust, is um, how we approach, uh, if you will, how we get to the Holocaust. And one of our prime objectives was to work against the dominance of the Holocaust as the primary prism through which this thousand year history is told in umpteen different pardon me, museums and history books <clears throat> and films. In other words, we wanted our viewers, we wanted to help our visitors to bracket what they know about what came after so that they're not starting in the Middle Ages and they see some anti-Jewish violence and they think to themselves, that is the beginning of a story that will end with the Holocaust. Nor did we want our visitors to have the Holocaust in mind and be, if you will, foreshadowing it and backshadowing it. We wanted our visitors to stay in the moment of the story, uh, in, in the historical present of the story, and to avoid at all costs what we would call a teleological narrative that starts with hate and ends with genocide. This was for us a prime, prime goal. So where this becomes most pressing is in the gallery that deals with the 1920s and 30s, with the period between World War I and World War II. And it was here that we worked hardest to work against the idea that Jews were on the edge of destruction, that somehow everything that happened in this period was either leading up to the Holocaust or a premonition of the Holocaust, because it was not. And so when we walk down this interwar year street, which is a lot less spectacular than the one in the museum of the Second World War, you look down the street, you do not see the Holocaust. What you see, and, and, and you're basically uh, you know, walking down the street, is only when you turn the corner that you will see uh, that you will see the American ambassador and his um, staff standing outside the American embassy about to evacuate after September 1st and the German invasion. Now, I, what I want to do just briefly, just a second, let me see if I can go back. I, I, what I would like to do is to, to say a, word, a few words about mode of narration. And then I think what I'll do is I'll conclude with that so that we can have time for, for discussion. Now, the Holocaust gallery itself uh, is not anticipated. The whole point is no anticipation of the Holocaust. And because, in fact, in Poland, when the Germans invaded on September 1st, for the citizens, for the civilian population, it came as a surprise. They really weren't expecting it. They were on vacation. 
And then the word went out and people came back from the ocean and from the mountains. And of course, there was the siege, the, the first month of the, of the occupation. And even, even in Poland, the, the state, it was only about six weeks to two months before the invasion that they began to realize that Poland would be invaded. In fact, they really didn't believe that the Germans would invade Poland. So we, we wanted to really to work against that teleology. And so we developed a mode of narration that we used all the way through the entire exhibition to narrate in the historical present without foreshadowing or backshadowing. And we do that by narrating what we call the pri uh, narrating in the first person. And we do that by driving the entire exhibition from primary sources, from quotations that are, are supported with commentary. In other words, by what actually has the feeling of being a play script, which is set within our scenographic approach. Our narration is multi-voiced. There are many, many, many voices from the period that our visitors encounter. And then there is our curatorial voice, which is a kind of second layer. It is, we don't lead with our voice. We lead with the voices of those whose stories we're telling. We do not offer any narrative closure. There is no redemptive message. There is no way to wrap this story up in some, uh, you know, with a bow at the end. And we're very careful about image ethics and the intimacy of violence. We avoid the, you might call it the pornography of atrocity, and we avoid manipulation of emotion. We are somewhere between the absolute minimalism of what I would call a kind of classic German approach and the very spectacular high register emotion of approaches that I think that the, in part, that the Museum of the Second World War uses, it's not a criticism, it's, it's simply an observation. And at, at its very worst, what was uh, proposed in a, a draft project for the Museum of Babinyar. And so I think with that, I think I will conclude so we can stay within our time and then open up to uh, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for a fascinating uh, lecture. I almost can hear an apl applause of, uh, from uh, <laughs> all our listeners. Uh, we have uh, now uh, more, uh, almost 100 listeners here. So I would like to encourage uh, all of you to ask question or on a chat and uh, on YouTube or through uh, Slido, uh, the information you can see on your screen. So I uh, really invite you uh, to ask Barbara some questions. And now maybe I have first one from uh, my colleague from the Institute of the Study of the Totalitarian Regimes, from Czenek Picha. And he asked you uh, to, could you please elaborate uh, more on uh, fusion or separation of functions of a memorial and museum? Where do you see the key dividing line between these kinds of institutions? It, yes, this is something I, I like to think about a lot. Okay, so let me come at it two ways. First of all, I would argue that, um, well, Okay, so at its simplest, and this is an oversimplification. Okay, at its simplest, a memorial requires a completely different uh, mindset, a different, um, uh, different uh, structure of feeling, but also a different set of practices. Let, let's think about what do you do at a memorial? What do you do at a memorial? It is, and now there are many things you do at memorials, um, and, and of course, we can see what's happening with all of these, um, this huge debate about monuments, you know, whether they're in Europe or are the Confederate monuments in the U.S., uh, the Columbus monuments, uh, the, um, so let me put it this way, I, in its simplest and its most classical sense, because this is a much more complicated topic, in its simplest and most classical sense, Monuments intended, uh, uh, memorials are intended to be commemorative. And there, and monuments intended to be monumental and also, and also commemorative. And as commemorative spaces, 
and as commemorative um, opportunities, they are places where one comes to reflect and to honor and to, um, I would say, they're, they're not usually places where you do analytical sort of um, top brain thinking. They're, they, they tend not to be particularly didactic. I mean, think about them. The Vietnam Memorial, it is this in, you know, very long wall with a list of names. It doesn't have some elaborate explanation. It doesn't have multimedia. And of course, because for the veterans, this was too abstract, there's also a very conventional uh, kind of, you know, uh, unknown soldier kind of statue. Okay. But the they're commemorative. So in the case of the Warsaw, let's take a concrete example, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Memorial. On one side, it's the ghetto heroes, the fighters. And on the other side, it's from a year earlier, the great deportation of uh, 250,000 uh, Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto to the Treblinka death camp. Now, what are you supposed to do when you come to a monument like that? You know, there's minimal, minimal, minimal text. What you do is you lay a wreath, you light candles, you put stones, you you hold ceremonies, and it might be Israeli groups that come, as uh, you know, from the Israeli military or the youth groups. It might be on the um, it might be the commemoration of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising on, on April 19th, or it might be the funeral of Marek Edelman, who was the last living um, uh, leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. That's what you do at the monument. Now, of course, there are other things. You can also, uh, it can be also an opposite. You can also do things that are oppositional, of course. But oppositional is not what this, not what this kind of a monument asks you to do. So it, it doesn't ask you to think critically. You might reflect, you know, it, it's up to you. It's very open. What, if, what about, what is the museum? The museum is an institution of public history. And I keep on arguing it's not a Jewish museum. It's not a Holocaust museum. It is a museum of public, it's an institution of public history. And as such, it should be, and it struggles to be in this current climate, a critical museum. And that is that as a critical museum and, and, and in fulfillment of many of the, I would say, much of that new ICOM definition, what does it stand for? What, 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 what kind of impact does it want to have? So if I were to formulate it, maybe the more conventional formula would be, oh, we should learn from this history and we, you know, don't, it should be anti-hate and, and against anti-Semitism, et cetera. I actually wouldn't, I wouldn't formulate. And for me, that's, um, I, I would take, first of all, I would argue that the beauty of this museum, a Pauline museum in particular, is its approach of constructive engagement a constructive engagement, that, that it is, rather than a museum of indictment, it is, uh, because I think this is really interesting, the German museums are museums of self, the, the ones that are dealing with the war and with the Holocaust, are museums of self-indictment. And they, there are many other museums, Holocaust museums are museums of indictment. They indict. They are museums that hold the perpetrators to account. In Germany, the perpetrators hold themselves to account. That's the difference between you know, indictment and self-indictment. But also, there's been a big shift in, say, the Holocaust museums that is, in a way, very similar to the shift of the Museum of the Second World War, which is a shift from being perpetrator histories to being victim histories, from being soldier histories to being civilian histories. Same events, same events. And th those shifts are really, are really, really important. And there's another shift, which is a shift from Hilberg's categories of perpetrator, victim, bystander to saying, hey, wait a minute, bystander? What kind of residual category is that? Are these categories, and I think this is going to make a big difference in some of these historical narratives, because the beauty of the, the double narrative at the, in Berlin uh, at the Russian German Museum is that there are moments where the victims are perpetrators and there are moments where the perpetrators are victims, that these are not such stable categories, and which is not a way of making perpetrators any less perpetrators. But at the same time, the bystander category is very heterogeneous. It isn't just, 
you know, by people who sort of stood by and, you know, crossed their arms and just watched. It's a much more heterogeneous category. So in order to be able to address uh, or, or to be a critical museum um, and to have, a, um, I would say, the kind of impact, our constructive engagement means that we aren't just about learning, quote, the lessons of hate. On the contrary, we also want to learn the lessons of coexistence. That is very important for us. But the bigger, bigger way of thinking about this is that museums, if museums were to fulfill the mandate of the new ICOM definition, they would strengthen the resilience of civil society. And there is nowhere where that is more important than in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe. Nowhere where that is more important in countries that have moved in an authoritarian direction where uh, I would say there is a challenge to democratic values. Um, and, and, and I would say in the United States as well, a mature democracy, so-called. I mean, supposed to be a mature democracy. Strengthening of the resilience of civil society, You know, we know what it looks like. We know that it looks like in these street demonstrations, we know what it looks like in this uh, push to get out the vote. So that's the first thing, strengthening the resilience of civil society. And that is something that a museum can do. Memorials can also. I think that actually the one in Montgomery, Alabama, the lynching museum, that memorial, that memorial, it says self-indict. Take that element that, that is about the lynchings in your town. Take it back. Reckon with it. So there is a way in, a way in which memorials can do that too, but they do it differently. And the opportunities that a museum offers are quite different. So for us, the way I put it is this way, that the museum strengthens, that the museum, uh, I would say, completes the memorial complex, that we go to the memorial to honor those who died by remembering how they died. And we go to the museum to honor them by remembering how they lived and how they lived for a thousand years. And we place this traumatic event within a thousand year history that has in it many other traumatic moments, including the council pogrom and post-war violence and, and, and you know, anti-Semitism during the interwar years and et cetera. But they are complementary, And for us, making the distinction is very, very important. I think it's handled differently in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, but I think that the d distinction, the difference, the way it's handled at the, in Berlin, the murder Jews of Europe is fascinating for me as well. So, um, but it's, um, and, and maybe one last point, and that is for many visitors to Poland, particularly Jewish visitors for whom the Holocaust is their main reason for coming, for them, in many ways, the museum is a different kind of memorial. We don't, we don't intend it to be, but for them it is. And what it is, it's a memorial, not only to those who died, but also a memorial to the world that was destroyed with them. And they feel the loss even more deeply when they realized that this entire world was lost, that this entire world was destroyed. So for them, the um, there is a kind of uh, way in which this story that we tell functions in a memorial way for them, for their experience. So that's how I begin to think about it. Thank you a lot for, for your answer. Uh, I have there another question uh, from also my colleague, uh, Jakub Jarez. Uh, and uh, Jakub writes, uh, in, uh, I quote, in the last decades, we have witnesses uh, witnessed a worldwide boom of new museums with huge buildings and persuasive narratives, uh, including examples you have mentioned. My concern is whether these giant museums don't overwhelm its visitors too, too much and whether we should rather look for alternatives in small decentralized and personalized uh, institutions. In other words, uh, how do you see the future of museums in terms of their size? Well, you know, in our pandemic era, 
which is not going to be over anytime soon. And when we say post-pandemic, we mean the lingering pandemic, not end of pandemic. Post, in this instance, is that the it's going to linger. We know that. We know that. And I think that uh, many there are many small museums and maybe, well, there are many bigger museums that are getting smaller and many small museums that will close and never reopen. So the idea of undertaking major, big, huge museum projects now, uh, we have to see, we have to see. But some of the most, I think, powerful, most wonderful museums are tiny. I mean, minute they would fit into the smallest gallery of the biggest museum. And I'm thinking about uh, the museum um, to a righteous family in Riga uh, that actually won one of the European Museum of the Year awards. Um, a, a wonderful tiny museum in a little building, exquisite, absolutely exquisite. I'm thinking of, um, there's another very, very small one. Oh yes the Museum of War Childhood in Sarajevo. Minute. And all it is, I mean all, all it is is one person, one object, one story. One after the other, after the other, after the other in small, simple showcases. There, It is enormously powerful. And I think it got the Council of Europe prize. So there is... Um, it, you know, it takes a, a kind of uh, curatorial imagination to be able to create. I like to think of it as, and there are other museums. I think of it as like this. I say small museums with big ideas. That size, for me, the size that matters is the idea. Big ideas, curatorial imagination at, on a small scale can be just so, so, so impactful. So I think there's huge potential there. Um, I've been working with a project in Lithuania in uh, Shaduva uh, called the Lost Shtetl Project, which is also a small museum that I think is going to be a gem. And there are some other, um, th th there are now actually efforts to create a Jewish museum in Belarus, which I think could also be a relatively small museum. Um, and it's the exact opposite of the more spectacular, the better, which is the way they're thinking at Babin Yar. And, you know, whether that'll ever be realized, you know, we'll see. But um, I, I would say this, that the, uh, you know, spectacular, this is really cultural. It's really, really cultural. You know, whether it's um, the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center in Moscow or the Gulag Museum, or which is a very interesting museum, incidentally, or whether it's the Museum of World War II, which is quite spectacular. I just don't see, I don't, I, I just don't see it in um, in Germany. I think it's a, I think it's a cultural issue. And I think that it has to do also with what I call structure of feeling. Or for example, the Museum of the Warsaw Uprising in Warsaw. Oh my goodness. It was the first multimedia narrative museum in Poland. Spectacular. You know, it's got this um, kind of like a freestanding freestanding wall that goes from the bottom to the top. And you're supposed to put your ear to it. And when you put your ear to it, you hear a heartbeat. Unima you know, there it's at Bully Museum. Unimaginable. Unimaginable. Or, or actually the Imperial War Museum in, in London, which is, they're doing a completely new Holocaust section and they did a wonderful, very interesting new World War I museum and they're, they're doing new things. But I remember in the older exhibitions, you know, there would be the um, air raid shelter. It would be the, the, the sort of the experience, sit in a kind of a chamber and experience what it was like for uh, London to be bombed. I can't, you know, I can't imagine that. There are, you know, if there's some museums where it would be unimaginable. So I do think it has to do with a certain structure of feeling, a certain cultural um, set, uh, a certain way of thinking about museum experiences. And um, yeah, so there's not one answer. Thank you very much. We have last 10 minutes to the discussion. There are some new 
questions, but uh, yeah, maybe I have one my own question, which is uh, really short, <laughs> and uh, it's just it's uh, about uh, your lecture. Can we say that uh, the contemporary trends in exhibiting the past? Have, uh, its roots in exhibiting history which took place in Central and Eastern Europe, e.g. Holocaust. So can we say that the like new American or US USA museums are inspired by the European one, or is it the overinterpretation? Very a, a very, very good question. So what I would say is that um Okay, so there there are well. First of all, we have to we have to differentiate between site specific museums and uh, museums that are not on a, on the site that they're about. So we would have to distinguish, for example, Auschwitz, which is obviously a combination of the site, uh, the museum, and and memorial. There, it's all three elements on a very 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 big site. And the issue of what to do with it and its memorialization was there from almost right after the war. And the, you know, in a, in a way, I think it's very instructive to look at the history and the evolution of that site. That would be very, 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 very instructive. So, so, so the first thing we would note is what we would call site-specific uh, museums. And, you know, we could contrast, like say Auschwitz with topography of terror in Berlin, for instance. Uh, where you have very, you know, very little that remains to look at, but where you try to somehow rather uh, recover the emotional power of the site in a, in other ways. But okay, site specific. Then um, and, and those those be the, there's a the big question as to who owns the site. Is it a Polish site? Is it a German site? Is it a Jewish site? So all of those complicated questions. Then you have museums that are Uh, built completely afresh in places that are meaningful, but not site-specific in that way. So Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and the United States Holocaust Memorial in Washington. And each of them position themselves as part of a national narrative. And that's what's so fascinating for me is to see how Holocaust museums are set within national narratives. And Israel, an Israeli national narrative, you walk through Yad Vashem, when you get through the, the end of the story, you find yourself on a kind of promontory overlooking the hills of Judea, the Judean hills at the city of Jerusalem. And this Holocaust story ends with the forming of the state of Israel. So it's, it's set within that national narrative. In the United States, it's set within the national narrative of the role of American troops in liberating uh, camps you know, and the participation, if you will, of the United States very late to enter the, the war in Europe because from an American perspective, World War II was fought in the Pacific. But that's, you know, that's another, that's another whole story. So my, my sense is that the, uh, the creating Holocaust museums really advanced outside of Eastern Europe, of outside of Eastern and Central Europe. That in Eastern and Central Europe, I think that, that, that the, The earliest developments are site specific. The earliest developments are site specific. You have so many sites that the whole country is a Holocaust museum. Everywhere you go, there, you know, if, if you're prepared and you're willing to somehow rather bring the historical awareness, the whole, you know, you know, whether it's stumbling stones as a reminder that that the whole place was a site of the Holocaust, or it's the, if you will, spectacular. Um, uh, remains, Bindanek, um, Auschwitz, or say Belgitz, where there was an attempt to cover it all up. And in a way, you have to kind of, if not excavate it, somehow rather uh, remind, create a kind of reminder, which is essentially a memorial with a small museum. So I, I would say that in Europe, that the site-specific uh, nature of Holocaust commemoration And then the addition of a museum element, that's the way it goes. But that the actual creating of major museums that try to tell the whole story of the Holocaust really developed outside. So it's Yad Vashem, Holocaust uh, Museum in Washington, it's Memorial de la Shoah, and, and other uh, memor <coughs> pardon me, Museum of Jewish Heritage, 
um, in uh, lower Manhattan and, and, and the like. Thank you very much for your answer. And I would say we have one uh, space for one last question for for short uh, answer. And Wojciech uh, Rybka uh, ask you, I quote, uh, your evaluation of German approach, the more emotional or dramatic topic, the less spectacular presentation sounds sensible to me, uh, but still isn't the degree of emotionality contingent upon social groups visitors come from? So, um. Yes, 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 of course. Well, you know, I really, um, I find the German approach very, very powerful. And also, um, I would say that there's another, I wouldn't call it a shift, but I'd say um, um, options or alternatives. So that if you were to take as a limit case, one end of the spectrum, I would take Crimes of the Wehrmacht. When that exhibition first appeared, I mean, then it went through various transformations and it traveled and it got elaborated, but I liked when it first appeared. When it first appeared, it was so minimalist It was so nerdy, I would say. It's like for, you know, it was, um, it, 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 how can I, it was like hospital partitions. You know, it was a board exhibition. Is there anything more boring than a board exhibition? It was just white panels and they printed on these white panels, texts, documents, photographs. But the evidence was so eloquent And it was, and the story was so shocking that certainly for German visitors, it was extraordinary. In fact, there was a little documentary film that was made um, in the exhibition. I don't think in the original place it was shown. It was called, I think, either From the East. I've forgotten the name of the film, where the videographer, where the filmmaker filmed reactions. And you had young people who were so shocked, they were traumatized by this exhibition, which was the most unspectacular exhibition imaginable. How could it be? How, my father, my uncle, my grandfather? It's not possible. It can't be. And 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 if it could be, you know, how do, how do I live with this? How do I deal with it? So I think that for me is like the, the end point. At the other end of the spectrum, I would point to Jewish Museum Berlin which is opening uh, or has just opened its new permanent exhibition. And I think like the lynching museum in Montgomery, it is really, uh, it, re it represents the more, it represents a greater use of what I would call the poetic uh, register. So that, you know, you've got on the one hand, this very minimalist documentary sort of, Uh, end of the spectrum German approach, but you have another German approach, which says that there's a way to communicate powerfully that is not spectacular, but is rather, um, I would say, uh, poetic and aesthetic, although all actually, in fact, and it's very design led, and they're working with great designers. And these designers really, and in the case of the Montgomery example too, these designers really know how to work with Um, exhibition as a medium so that the um, that the physical um, uh, the physical exhibition itself is doing a lot of the work but not through banal spectacularism you know banal spectacularism means literal recreations of a street or a war scene or a bunker experience of the underground and the bombing and the sound effects and the heartbeat I mean, those, I would say, verge on kitsch. There's a very, very fine line, very fine line between those kind of, I would say, cheap effects, kitsch, and really, um, I would say, a more disciplined approach to, in our case, a, 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 a theater of history. And in the case of the Berlin Museum, um, creating powerful experiences that are really inspired by contemporary art. And contemporary art, installation art, um, uh, immersive experiences that are coming more from contemporary art 
than from commercial entertainment. So I, I, I think that there's something going on that represents paradigm shifts within exhibition practices and not only curatorial practices, but also architecturally. I think that if we were to look at paradigm shifts architecturally, curatorially, historical narrative, and exhibition design, I think we have to look across all four to really try to, to really kind of come to grips with what we're calling a par calling paradigm shifts. Thank you very much. I would say these four points are a really great uh, conclusion or uh, of our discussion because we are out of time. So thank you very much once again, Barbara, for your time, for your lecture and for your answers. It was, uh, I would say, great uh, opportunity for all of us. I would also like to say thank you for our interpreters and to all of you who have listened to us. So thank you very much. And I would like also to invite you to the next panels of this conference. Uh, the next one is beginning in 30 minutes. It's called Museums in Emotions. And uh, I, I think uh, it, uh, there we can continue in uh, the discussion which uh, we have started here. So thank you very much to all of you, you and take care. Thank you very much. I wish you much success with the conference. Thank you very much. Okay, take care.